don't know what you're talking about. He was mischievous. That's what he was. What do you look like in the morning? OK. What do you look like in the morning? <laughs> he didn't care who he offended, you see. God had a good day when he gave you your face, didn't he? <laughs> Russell Harty was a huge star on British television in the 70s and 80s. He was loved by everyone. Well, almost everyone. Ah. Now, hold, hold. He created a whole new way of interviewing. What are you frightened of? Letting myself down. But he was cruelly hounded by the tabloid press about his private life. I mean, nobody cared. Russell Harty was gay. It was hardly hold the front page. Frederick Russell Harty was born in Blackburn, Lancashire on the 5th of September 1934 to Fred and Myrtle, fruit and vegetable stallholders in the local market. North or south when I open my mouth, they know that I'm not Dutch. They can tell I come from Lancashire, but they can't tell me much. I whispered I'll be nudist if you'll... I mean, they were what were they? Working class people at the stall on Blackburn Market. Interesting, and they watched this, this child of theirs zoom away and become this extraordinary figure that he became. He was sort of like a cuckoo in the nest, really. Uh, you didn't know where he came from. Believe me, Russell did never work on the market. No. The, the house was absolutely spotless. Uh, Myrtle kept it highly polished, but she didn't like Russell going to the library, for instance, because she thought that uh, the books would be dirty. Get him out. Get him out of here. You can get theory off that kind of stuff. Get him out of here, quick. <laughs> and it took me, you know, a long time of under the bedclothes and secretly getting books in. You know, that, that was his passion. He, he loved to read and he loved to, uh, to learn. Through a combination of hard work and northern brass, Russell escaped the life of a market stallholder by gaining a scholarship to Oxford University in 1954. Good evening, and welcome to Oxford, to Exeter College, Oxford, to Room 3, Staircase 3. As blank and bleak and bare room as it was 31 years ago when I first came here as a nervous little northerner. So, in his early 20s, he came away burnished with this great backup of this I can beat the world thing, with a degree, and no fear. And that's what made Russell, Russell. When he left Oxford in 1958, despite longing for a career in showbiz, Russell felt that he needed a steady job, so he applied for a position as teacher at Giggleswick School in Yorkshire. He struck me then as, as somebody who was a, a one-off. Russell did have some quite unorthodox teaching methods, as revealed on This Is Your Life some years later. And if you look at that screen, we're going to hear how you are responsible for one of the greatest giggles, giggles wicks ever known from the now deputy headmaster, Warwick Brooks. Hello, Russell. Do you remember you were taking a class for geography and you suggested to them for no good reason that coal was not the only thing that came out of the ground in Yorkshire. Treacle did as well. So he borrowed a very large tin of treacle, a sort of four pound tin of treacle from the school chef and uh, took it out and buried it in uh, a sort of slag heap at, at Rathmull, and then took the boys out equipped with pot helmets and torches and bigs and what have you, and uh, had them dig away and dig away until they unearthed this huge tin of treacle. I found it! <laughs> now, people were paying good money to have their children educated like this. Well, maybe it was just a bit of fun. After eight happy and successful years at Giggleswick, where, incidentally, Richard Whiteley was one of his pupils, a restless Russell was inspired by the success of Oxford friend Alan Bennett. The bright lights of London and the world of TV beckoned. He worked, slaved and connived to get into television. He wrote to Humphrey Burton and said, I gather you're doing a new programme, and I think if you don't have me, I will not be responsible for the consequences. <laughs> I like the cut of Russell's jib, as they say. I thought he was just the right sort of unconventional personality that would suit the program that I was putting together. I had no staff, virtually no budget, so uh, I hired him. In the list of people who are working, artists alive working in the world today, where, where do you figure in the hierarchy? 
uh, um, Dali, the first, the first. The first. Ah, yes, this. Is there is nobody more important. No, no doubt. But no, because Dali is very good. It's only because Lothar is so bad. <laughs> I mean, if you look at his Dali interview, I mean, when he met somebody like that who was as eccentric as he was, it was a perfect collision. You say it was warm, it's freezing. Bonjour. Bonjour. I mean, he was an, a clever man, an academic, uh, who masqueraded as a popular entertainer. God alone knows what this man dreams about. And it wasn't long indeed after the Aquarius programme started that Cyril Bennett, our very wise and wonderful uh, controller programmes, plucked Russell out from, from me and said, I want him on, my own, on his own. Russell stepped out into the world of light entertainment, presenting a chat show for LWT. Most people saw Russell Harty Plus as a rather idiosyncratic um, hodgepodge. <laughs> Sorry, Russell. Behind the bus. Yes, what is yes. your parrot called? Joey. Joey. Mind your own business. You finished, are I'm grateful for the point. People liked Russell because he was so unusual in terms of television. He was very camp. Who's your idol? You are right. <laughs> What you got was quite cheeky questions with this um, northern accent. It was an unusual combination. What, first of all, is a big guy like you doing with a name like Jean? <laughs> My favourite interview of all time was the, the time that he met Sir Ralph Richardson. What a wonderful view you've got. <laughs> what a wonderful view. <laughs> I mean, you could see anything out of here, couldn't you? I mean, you could see the Tower of London, you could see Buckingham Palace, you could see the Post Office Tower, couldn't you? I bet you could. I can't see anything. <laughs> I always thought that when you walked onto Russell's set, that what you should have was a garden wall, and he should be dressed with a headscarf and a pinny. It was very chatty. It was a real chat show. You look very well. Yes, thank you. You look very bronzed and fit and brown. Do I? Mm. Yeah. Where have you been? Ulster. <laughs> <laughs> The boy from Blackburn was never easily starstruck, but there was one group of people who, for Russell, transcended mere celebrity, the royals. I mean, his ideal guest, I think, would have been the Queen Mum. I remember him getting so excited about Princess Diana coming to Giggleswick, which, you know, he was instrumental. She then um, asked him if he'd like a lift back to London because she'd come up by helicopter, and he said, oh, yes, please. Well, he hadn't intended to go back to London, but it was just the honour of travelling with her. That meant a lot to him. So off he went in the helicopter and then got the train back to Giddeswick. Russell would have crawled on broken glass to get an invite to Kensington Palace. Ladies and gentlemen, Russell Harty. As Russell's popularity grew, so did the comparisons to that other great interviewer of the era. The press thought there was a huge rivalry between Russell and Michael Parkinson. And the media had a wonderful time sort of, you know, talking up the differences between us and, and, and pretending that there was, or saying that there was a, uh, a deep rift between us. And we used to go for lunch and get drunk and, and laugh at it. The so-called rivalry with Parkey would come to an end after a reshuffle at LWT left Russell without a show after a seven-year run. But in 1979, he was given a role in the new topical panel show, Saturday Night People. Saturday Night People. Why are you separated from us geographically? There's a hole between you and Janet, if you'll forgive the expression. I have absolutely no idea, but it's doing nothing for my confidence. <laughs> <laughs> However, the show didn't really suit Russell's style, and he wasn't happy. Another series would be over his dead body. He wanted to go back to doing talk shows, doing doc documentaries, and retreat into a world that he could control. A call from his old friend, Humphrey Burton, now a producer at the BBC, would put Russell back in the driving seat. I, as it were, persuaded Russell to come to the BBC. BBC Two wanted to do something a bit different with their hot new property. We just thought, well, let's not do an ordinary chat show. He's not an ordinary person. Where do I stand here? So it was decided Russell's new show would be live and dangerous. How does it feel? Oh, desperate. Live television was absolutely the magic ingredient for Russell. <laughs> And that's kind of what made it work, I think. And now you're 
can't turn on the wireless or the TV without this little face looking at you or his little voice sort of groaning on it. You know, we, we sort of loved it. He, Russell used to say, oh, God, it's a chip shop, isn't it? The whole his, his phrase was, oh, it's a chip shop, when things really went wrong. <laughs> And it never went more wrong for Russell than when this particular guest came on the show. It was just a really embarrassing item. I've no idea what Grace Jones was on that night. An overestimated. You know, she is not necessarily 100% um, unintoxicated. No, I'm I've, I've very seldom do that. No, 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 no. If you turn your back no, to no, me for one more minute, I, have, I, have I mean, got, really. I have got this to talk to This has been going this. on too long already. Hang on. I'm not being... Nobody's taking any notice of me. Hello. Let, well, let, maybe I should go let right exp- now, No, then. don't go right now unless you really want to. Well, don't turn no, your no, back I can't, on me so anymore. I can't look at you. Ah. <laughs> now, hold, hold, hold. 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 Hold on, just a moment. Just, oh, a, just It was an accident waiting to happen, and the truth is, if Russell had been sitting there and she'd been sitting here, it wouldn't have happened. Russell absolutely hated every moment of it. The whole experience was a nightmare for him. <laughs> there was one woman, however, who was more than happy to be seeing Russell on the BBC, his biggest fan and his biggest critic, his mum. She's the he thought the world of her. Every birthday, no matter where he was, he would travel back to to be with her for a birthday. What's been keeping you, Russell? I've got my best frock on, ready for that night out. Well, that night out's going to be here in London because she helped us with our surprise by travelling here absolutely unknown to you on our 78th birthday today, your mother, Myrtle. <laughs> I mean, Myrtle, his mother... You know, she wore, wore the trousers, one felt, and she put up with absolutely no nonsense. I mean, he was still quite fearful of her, even well into middle age. And she turned to me and she said, I don't know what all the fuss is about, it's only our Russell. And that's how she thought of him, our Russell, you know. You may be a big cheese in London, but you bugger all up here. Now, just remember that. The northern directness learned from Mother Myrtle stood Russell in good stead, especially for this acclaimed interview with a notoriously reticent Dirk Bogard. I mean, Bogard was a difficult man, and Russell got that something that was there with Bogard. He got it out of him, the only one who ever did. Is it going to be more than monosyllabic, do you think? Not much. (laughs) (laughs) Are you proud of anything you've done? No. Find another word. Not proud. Pleased. Uh, Pleased. You pleased? Yeah. Yeah, But you're so rude to people. (laughs) <laughs> I'm told, anyway. I haven't been rude to you yet. No, you haven't yet, but I'm waiting for it, you see. <laughs> he was rightly wary because Russell was very, very clever and he could unpeel the onion like nobody else. What are you frightened of? Letting myself down. <laughs> After three years, Russell moved from BBC Two to BBC One, but the new, higher-profile show attracted guests keen to promote their latest book or movie something Russell had always wanted to avoid. And eventually, this endless round of which celebrity is in town and who we should have rather got him down, I think. And and he wanted to to go on to different... It's 1985, and with 13 years of talk shows behind him, Russell Harty embarked on the next phase of his career. Returning to his first love, documentary films and hosting a series of travelogue programmes. Dig up our roots now, and next weekend we move south to warmer climes to the Principality of Monaco. These popular shows took him around the world, and back nearer to his roots in Yorkshire, where for some years he'd kept a house of his own. He treated it very much as his retreat, and uh, and somewhere that uh, he could get away from work. And he had a whole other life. Outside London, he felt much more comfortable there. He felt more anonymous. But these two worlds collided when Russell threw a party. His regular get-togethers were legendary. And showbiz pals would troop up from London to join in the fun with local family and friends. Russell's Christmas parties were a particular favourite with his celebrity guests. And it was a natural next step for them to be shared with the nation on the BBC. 
it wasn't that much different, except you were tripping over a camera crew and the cast was slightly more starry. Scylla Black came and she was sitting in the sitting room waiting to go in and do her little song. You don't bring me flowers. It could be slightly surreal, unless you were used to it, but with Russell, you were used to it. Russell had this wonderful way of making an ordinary occasion into a celebration. I, I don't know about you, but this is certainly the best Christmas Eve I've had since this time last year. Me <laughs> Just nine weeks after this show was broadcast, and while still grieving over the death of his mother, Russell had some shattering news for his family. He rang up and said that there was um, a story going to be printed, and he was clearly devastated. The news of the world had revealed that Russell was homosexual and alleged that he had paid for sex with a male prostitute. I think the stories in the newspapers were very damaging. I think they hurt him hugely. Suddenly, you know, this very warm person, who, this very generous, very giving person, had been attacked, really. And for what? The only way I could describe it was kind of a witch hunt, really. You have to go back in those days and remember how difficult it was being homosexual in those days and, and the kind of witless criticisms that were made of people like Russell and the determination of, of some of the seedier parts of our media to discover terrible things about him. I mean, they sent rent boys round to him to, to blackmail him, in a sense. I mean, the thing about uh, Russell and his sexuality is he absolutely didn't want his family involved in all this, and most of all, he didn't want his mother to know. I'm just so grateful that Mum and Dad never knew, because she would have been devastated. Russell had, in fact, been in a long-term relationship for several years with writer Jamie O'Neill. Jamie was delightful and talented and wrote. Without question, Russell was very fond of him. What he was frightened of was not being gay. He, he was quite happy for anybody to know he was gay. What he was frightened of was somebody saying it. When the um, News of the World story happened, I think Russell thought wrongly that it was the end of his life, the end of his career. Um, if only he'd remembered his own dictum that it was only yesterday's fish and chips. He then started accepting absolutely everything that was offered to him, which meant he was working all the hours God sends and, you know, tiring himself out. The final TV show Russell presented was Mr Harty's Grand Tour in 1988 where he walked in the footsteps of 18th century travellers. The Grand Tour was a really exciting time because it was something that he absolutely loved doing, I think. I came from Assisi, go to Rome and then to Napoli. Great pleasure. Great pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I don't think he ever thought at the time that that Grand Tour was going to be his last sort of big, you know, his swan song. Um, it was when the health problems set in, of course, and it altered everything for him. And then he just seemed to go downhill really quickly, and the next thing he was in hospital. The diagnosis wasn't good. Russell had caught hepatitis B, and in combination with overwork and stress, he became seriously ill. A brief statement issued by the hospital early this morning said that Russell Harty had maintained his condition throughout the night, but was still critically ill. The British press had little sympathy for Russell. Only months after outing him, they were now convinced that he was lying about his illness. The reporters disguised themselves as doctors. And what were they after? Proof that he was dying of an AIDS-related disease. I mean, come on. You know, I mean, the man's dying, for God's sake. What are you doing? But that was how it worked, and they were appalling. Meanwhile, the seriousness of Russell's condition continued to fluctuate. For over quite a period, They'd, um, he'd be stable and people would think, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, perhaps it's going to be all right. Sad as it is, every step that we thought we'd, we'd got, you know, a glimmer of hope. And it was, yeah, it was all... all <laughs> whether he was going to live or not. And then he didn't. And it was a real, sorry, 
It was a real shock. Real shock. We just all assumed he'd get better. Russell Harty, one of television's most popular personalities, has died in hospital in Leeds. Mr. Harty, who was 53, had been suffering from hepatitis and acute liver failure. It was very, very sad because he was too young to die. And he was also at the prime of his career, really. I just feel it was, it was a pity it was too soon. He could have had a lot more fun. His life wasn't over. Russell Harty was buried in the Yorkshire Dales in his beloved Giggleswick. Giggleswick meant so much to him and had done for so many years. The grave is within sight, really, of the school. And it's a beautiful setting. And Russell's memories of Giggleswick from his younger days as a master were very strong. And the house where he lived, he loved and the village he loved, and I don't think he could have ended up in any other place where he would have chosen to be rather than that. I think Russell would be thrilled that a programme is still being done about him 20, nearly 30 years after he died. And that's a mark of the man, and he would be thrilled by that. We always think, as a family, what it would have been like if Russell had been here, it would have been funnier. <laughs> That's what I remember, the joy. The joy. I just miss him every day of my life because he was fun, he was jolly. He was a great empowerer of making people laugh. And I think we miss him, all of us still. We became you know, very dear friends, and uh, I miss him. <laughs>